Good morning, welcome to day two of MWISE. Hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. A couple of announcements before we get started. 12.15 is lunch. Uh, there are also lunch and learns at 12.15. Now these are first come, first serve, so if you're interested in the lunch and learns, please get down there early. Also at 12.15, Jane McGonagall, who is our keynote speaker tomorrow, author, uh, game designer, researcher, she will be signing books on the Explo uh, Expo floor starting at 12.15, so that's a while supplies last. Also tomorrow, also today at 12.15, the Elevate Luncheon, if you pre-registered, that's in the Shaw meeting room, so uh, feel free to check that out. And I think there's a few slots available. If you haven't registered, you might be able to get in on that. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Please welcome Takehiro Sugiyama. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Takahiro Sugiyama. I'm an incident response consultant uh, from Mandiant. I came here from Japan to, for today. Today, I will share a story with you about bank heist. When you hear bank heist, do you see this? Or this? Both can be true, but for today, I will discuss an incident where a threat actor um, stole a lot of money from a bank through cyber intrusion. So this one, I hope you weren't expecting the others. <laughs> right. <clears throat> First of all, uh, please understand that I don't intend to disclose the victim's identity and some details have been changed. But the overall picture stays the same. Okay, let's get into the actual story. The victim was a bank in the Asia Pacific region. They were suffering from unauthorized withdrawals. A total of hundreds of thousands of US dollars was known to be stolen. Unfortunately, the bank didn't realize it um, very quickly. After a certain period of time, they realized it because of customers claiming their money was withdrawn from their accounts without their knowledge. So that's a lesson for you all. Um, you should check your transaction records regularly. That I am terrible at uh, putting it into, the, into practice. Of course, the bank started their uh, response investigating this incident. And they noticed that their CCTV captured the scene. A criminal showed up to an ATM terminal and inserted a completely fake card. It was indeed a convenience store card, but the ATM accepted it. Then the criminal withdrew money and repeated the same using, uh, using several other cards. It must be wrong, right? An ATM should not accept a convenience store card, but it functioned as a cash card. The bank tried to identify the cause of the incident, cause of withdrawals, but they weren't very successful with it. But they suspected something was wrong with their ATM system. And then switched, uh, they switched over the ATM, uh, ATM uh, system to the backup side, and the withdrawal stopped. Oh, good. It must have been with their ATM system, and they rebuilt it. They also uh, implemented um, any hardening measures they could think of. Now, all good? No. And this is why I'm sharing this story here with you. Months later, it happened again. The bank did not know why this was happening, except that their ATM system was behaving wrong. All they could do was switching it back to the primary side that had been rebuilt and hardened. Then the withdrawal stopped. No good? No. Obviously, the bank was not able to address the root cause of the incident because they didn't know why this was happening. And the second series of the 
withdrawals proved that it was just a matter of time before the incident will reoccur. So um, the bank did try to investigate this incident before. They engaged, uh, uh, they, they engaged multiple vendors to investigate uh, this, this incident, investigate their ATM systems and terminals. And one of the investigation identified that the ATM system was behaving wrong at a particular operation. But again, they, uh, they couldn't uh, give an explanation of why this was happening. And then the bank engaged as Mandiant uh, for this investigation because they knew that the ATM system was behaving wrong, uh, they asked us to perform system analysis of the ATM servers. They were running on Oracle Solaris operating systems. We opted in the fast forensic approach to identify possible compromises uh, from these servers. In our usual investigation, we would leverage EDL solutions to perform fast forensic analysis, but there are only a few uh, EDL solutions that support uh, Solaris operating systems. So instead, we uh, used our data correction script and acquired additional files of interest, applied our IOC's indicator of compromises, and generated a timeline based on the data corrected, analyzed them, and identified multiple malware installed on these servers, as well as straight actors access traces. It was a great step, because now we are likely able to say uh, the ADM system malfunction was caused by this system compromise. But still, there were unanswered questions left. One, how did the threat actor access the ATM system, whereas they were lo located deep inside of their environment? If this was a threat actor compromising these servers, they must have compromised other endpoints as well and maintained their access to the bank's network even after the ATM system reviewed. Two, how did the system compromise lead to the withdrawals, actually? At that point, there were just two observations, ATM server compromise and system malfunctioning. We needed uh, this answer to explain the incident. In order to address these questions, we continued our investigation, not only analyzing the, these uh, servers, but also uh, expanding our investigation to the entire environment of the bank. This was critical to successfully remove the threat actor from the environment. We also performed a thorough reverse engineering, uh, reverse engineering analysis of the malware identified on these servers. And I will discuss the findings uh, from this investigation. First malware I discuss is a slap stick. Uh, this is a backdoor and malicious spam, pluggable authentication module. PAM is a modular system to control authentication processes on Linux and uh, other Unix systems. By replacing a file using a legitimate path of a base authentication module, it intercepted uh, almost all authentication processes happening on, on that system. What it did was, firstly, logged all authentication attempts. Secondly, it allowed the thread actor to use magical password. Regardless of the account, if the password, given password matched with the magical password, any authentication attempts succeeded. 
slapstick, then continue to the usual uh, authentication process using the legitimate uh, original uh, PAM module. The thread actor installed this backdoor on almost every compromised server within this intrusion. The thread actor exclusively targeted Linux and Solaris operating systems. We suspected that the thread actor firstly got root password logged into the target server and installed this backdoor for ease of operation and to maintain persistence. It seemed to have worked well. The bank implemented multi-factor authentication as part of their hardening measures, but this slapstick allows the thread actor to bypass the MFA. The authentication attempts were logged onto a dot file in a temp directory of the compromised system. It was encoded uh, in a very simple manner. It was actually a substitution cipher, and it could just be uh, done with a TR command. Our company had previous experiences uh, with uh, this backdoor, so uh, we, uh, from the start, uh, we knew how to decode the file and using the TR command. By the way, the thread actor also used the same command to read the log file on the compromised systems. And this slide gives an example of a decoded log file. Have you noticed something here? It also recorded thread actor's logins using the magical password gave us tremendous value to track down thread actors' access. And thanks to this, we were able to visualize very good portions of uh, thread actors' rather movement activity within the environment. Okay, uh, Slapstick was used in the entire intrusion. And the other malware was used only on selected endpoints. Tiny Shell. This is a modified version of an open source backdoor. By chaining reverse shell connections, the thread actor was able to interact with the ADM servers deep inside of the environment. <coughs> and Where tiny shell was installed, kicked up was also installed. It was a rootkit and used to hide tiny shell's network connections from programs. How a rootkit works? It is usually loaded as a kernel module, and once the module is loaded, now the malicious code runs in the kernel space and can hook system calls. For example, program netstat um, calls a system call to get active network connections. But this system call was hooked by this rootkit, and it filled out the net backdoor network connections so that they can hide. OK, makes sense. Um, Kektap was used to hide tiny shells network connections. However, on just a single server, our malware uh, reverse engineering analysis identified an additional hook logic. And here is the very beginning of the analysis written by the, our reverse engineer. Uh, the same hook first checks if the value of the socket greater than two and the message length is 0x94 bytes. If so, the malware checks if the message starts uh, with the bytes 0092, bytes starting at offset 44, or 4B51, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When I read uh, this malware analysis for the first time. 
I was like, oh, what? <laughs> it was super cool, but super overwhelming. In short, the hook intercepted and manipulated network packets going now from the server. There was nothing wrong with, the, uh, with this analysis results. It gave us exactly how the hook behaved. But the challenge for us was it didn't give an explanation on why the hook behaved so right free because it was not programmed. And the hook logic was very difficult. It checked packet size, bytes at specific offsets, but no prop numbers, nothing obvious to indicate uh, what types of traffic to target. If possible, um, I would have captured network packets of, the, of this server, then looked for the packets matching the conditions. But unfortunately, it wasn't uh, a key. Uh, it wasn't an option for us uh, because this server was no longer in use. Uh, the ADM system was already switched over to the other side. <coughs> we thought this logic should be important because it existed only on this single server. But unfortunately, at that time, we couldn't solve, that, uh, solve this mystery. And we had more analysis to work on, and we needed to continue making the progress. But around a week later, we received application logs uh, from this server. We had requested them, but the bank had some difficulties restoring historical logs, and it took some time. And the logs were huge and really bad walls, even containing packet capture dumps of the messages sent to other systems in hex format. Looking at these dumps, we realized that um, these dumps precisely matched with the hook logic. Can you imagine? I was super, super excited uh, about this. And I received uh, the product manuals for application developers detailing the network protocol and spent a long weekend analyzing what was going on. Of course, I read through the malware analysis written by our engineer, even uh, wrote back uh, to the, the engineer, hey, this number 41, it should be in 42, shouldn't it? It is, the answer for, uh, it is the answer for everything. And finally, we got the explanation on how the threat actor achieved their operation to withdraw money that I will discuss in the following slide. <clears throat> but before that, let me give you a brief overview of uh, how the systems works together when a person is uh, withdrawing money from an ATM terminal. Thread actor's logic was indeed uh, related to this, uh, this operation, so it is important to understand the normal workflow first. Firstly, <clears throat> the person enters a card and the ATM terminal reads the chip on the card, and some cryptographic operation will be done to generate a code to verify the card itself. This message is sent to the ATM switch, which acts as a message hub to interface other systems. HSM hardware security module performs the actual check of the code to verify the card. Next, the person enters PIN. <clears throat> and the relevant message is generated and sent to the ADM switch. 
PIN is also verified by the HSM. And lastly, uh, the person enters how much to withdraw, etc. This transaction request is sent to the ADM switch, then to the core banking system. The core banking system performs the necessary checks, for example, if the account has enough balance to uh, make this transaction, etc., then authorizes it. And finally, the person receives the money from the ATM terminal. For the straight actor to use their own fake card, there are two hurdles. One, there was card verification. To pass the card verification, uh, the chip on the card needs to be installed with a proper key information. Second, there was PIN verification. If the straight actor was trying to steal money from other accounts, they need to know the pins set by those people. And as you can imagine, here, here was a trick performed by the rookie. <coughs> the scenario consists of two parts. Part one, a legitimate user using own card. Step one, card verification. The user uses a legitimate card, so there is no problem with this verification. However, uh, the root kit intercepted and altered uh, the car verification request message being sent to it, the HSM. By changing a type of the request message, it disabled the actual code verification but requested just to generate a code required to progress the workflow. A legitimate card uh, didn't need this alteration, but the straight actor implemented this, this logic indiscriminately, regardless of legitimate or fake cards. Step two, PIN verification. Nothing was wrong, except that the rookie intercepted and stored this PIN message in the memory. The PIN verification succeeded because it was a legitimate user. And step three, making a transaction. Uh, this was the same as the usual workflow. Part two, the straight actor using their fake card. Step one, card verification. The card and chip was prepared by the straight actor, programmed with an account number of another legitimate user. <clears throat> so because of that, of course, that didn't have the right chip on the card. With that, this verification should fail. However, the rookie uh, intercepted and altered the card verification request message. This process succeeded. By the way, it was not a random chip installed on, onto the card. It was a chip specifically crafted by this trade actor. During the verification code generation, uh, instead of the legitimate cryptographic algorithm, the chip calculated and generated the code using a completely different, a custom logic, using multiple parameters, including the account number. The root kit was also implemented with the same logic. So it was able to understand which calls are generated by the straight actor's card by following this custom logic. Step two, pin verification. Because the straight actor didn't know the right pin set by the other, another legitimate user, 
Um, instead, the thread actor inputs a random pin, for example, 1111. And the rootkit just discarded it, but used the pin message stored in the memory. I see uh, this as a sort of a replay attack. And the HSM verified the pin against the account that appeared in the part one. And this verification succeeded. With this, the ADM switch application was tricked and believed that pin verification was successful for the thread actor card programmed with the other legitimate user, a legitimate user's account. And lastly, uh, the, the thread actor um, just, just withdrew money from the, uh, from the ADM terminal. With that, this was how this thread actor stole, stole a lot of money from the bank over and over uh, for that long period. This was done by combination of the activities in both cyber and physical realm. And I saw this, uh, this intrusion as something special. Okay. <clears throat> Before closing this, uh, this session, um, I also share how it went after, after hmm? how it went after our investigation. The bank performed a thorough remediation activities, rebuilding the old compromised systems as well as implementing a lot of hardening measures advised by our remediation experts so that they could not only remove the uh, thread actor from the environment, but also make it harder for them to come back and operate. To date, it's been a while since our remediation, but there is no known unauthorized withdrawals after it. The thread actor, we mandiant track uh, this thread actor as ANC 2891. We have directly observed uh, this thread actor on multiple cases and also uh, heard more cases uh, from our partners where uh, this actor used the uh, same or similar techniques. <coughs> Lastly, takeaways. Uh, visibility on or around uh, non EDL supported endpoints. Recent days, uh, many organizations implement uh, EDLs, which is great. But I see there are challenges on how to address the endpoints uh, that are not supported by their EDLs. I don't have an easy answer, uh, but typically, uh, these, these operating systems, or legacy operating systems, were uh, used for specific purposes, organizations, core systems, and located deep inside of the network. I see these are great targets to implement anomaly detection based on system, network, application, logs, and data. <coughs> Regular checkups should also be helpful. For this, this aspect, I think uh, it's getting more and more important because recent days um, there are increased number of observations and reports where nation state actors are leveraging these non-traditional uh, systems for their, uh, their intrusion activity, such as uh, these legacy operating systems, network and security appliances, as well as hypervisors. Ransomware actors uh, also do some. Hardening also helps for these areas. <coughs> Many hardening measures are related to defining expected behaviors and limiting the others. This not only helps to prevent 
an incident or a damage by an incident, but also provides a trigger to notice something unexpected that could be a sign of an incident. And again, uh, check your transaction records regularly. Thank you very much, everyone. And I would like to hear uh, if you have any questions. Uh, were you able to figure out the initial access vector? How did they actually get in in the first place all the way into the ATM? It is a great question that I, I couldn't discuss during the, <laughs> during the presentation. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't figure it out. Um, when we are tracking thread actor traces, um, there seems to be just single server um, uh, sourcing to the, the all of uh, thread actor's activity. But this server had been decommissioned uh, long, long, back, uh, long, long back time, um, long, long time back, before we were engaged, and no one, no one in the bank's IT, IT team had any idea about this. So no, no context, context, and the endpoint was not available for, for analysis. So we, we couldn't tell that. <coughs> To tell more, uh, just answering to your questions, um, this is where hardening will play more and more important role, I think. So we were not able to, to tell uh, how the straight actor got into the environment. So uh, even after the remediation, we were not able to, uh, to ensure that the doors were closed, that the straight actor leveraged. But here, uh, remediation can help, at least, uh, at least a little bit at a certain level. Um, hardening would um, re reduce the risk and uh, increase the confidence still uh, that, uh, that the bank uh, had recovered from the incident. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, you mentioned nation state actors, so I'll, I'll just ask if you believe the nexus to UNC 1945 or Light Basin has grown stronger or weaker since you initially published this report. Thanks. Uh, so is it, is it a question for attribution for this threat actor? Okay. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I, I don't think we have published uh, an additional, additional attribution information for, for this threat actor, so I have no answer. Sorry. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned about the visibility on non-EDR uh, supported endpoints, right? So what would be the solution that you could propose and uh, how effective uh, that solution would be? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think <coughs> uh, it is more uh, uh, case by case uh, thing, uh, depending on uh, what systems and how these system, uh, systems were, were used uh, within the environment. Um, a very fundamental example I can think of is um, network. Um, it is actually um, one of the hardening, hardening techniques, but for example, it is actually as a, a, a real case scenario that a core banking system deep inside the network should be um, protected by firewalls. Um, there are only limited number of the sources expected to directly interact with a core banking system. So <clears throat> there can be firewall rules to limit the source of the, uh, for example, IP addresses <clears throat> to interact with the core, ba core banking systems. And if um, there was any other um, 
any other sources trying to, to uh, communicate with a core banking system, it should be flagged and should be, should be checked. <coughs> Another investigation I, I, I performed was actually relevant to this scenario. And at that time, hypervisor, actually Hyper-V server was, uh, was used to log into the core banking system. That is, that is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, um, it was actually the case uh, for, for, for this investigation. So even if um, you are not able to, to think of any additional telemetries um, can be used uh, from, from these systems, but, but still um, network telemetry uh, can be used. This is just, a, just one example. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Then, yep. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day.